So let's, let's look at the first block, block one. So this is the first block on the, on the left-hand side, right? So like P1, P2, P3. Um, so we're going to write down the implicit equations for those blocks. But and we want to we need to apply a fixed boundary condition right here. So on this side over here we have PB. Right? There there is no P0. This would be this sort of fake or ghost block over here, right? So to come up if we we need to replace P0 in this equation with something, and we can use the boundary condition to do that. So if we say that PB, since it's right at the center of blocks P0 and P1, we can say that we can take an average. And we say that PB is equal to the average of P0 and P1. So PB is known. P1 is something we're going to solve for, and P0 doesn't really exist. Right? So uh, what we want to do then is solve this equation for P0, and then we have 2PB minus P1, right? And then we can plug this over here for P0. And so if we do that, we have 2PB minus P1 in plus 1. That's equal to Or finally, 1 plus 3 eta P1 in plus 1. All right, so this is our equation for a Dirichlet condition on the left boundary. Right. And so again, using the same thing, everything we know on the right-hand side of the equal sign, we know PB because it's supplied as a boundary condition. It's given in the problem state. And then you see that the left-hand side is modified from the standard equation, which would be the first one. Right? So this is mod this would be the first equation due to the boundary condition is modified. Let's see. I don't think so. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this next part is going to answer 
the guys that came to my office and asked me a question on Friday, uh, I think in the notes, uh, it's worked out for an example of a no-flow boundary condition, right? So dp dx is equal to zero. Um, what we're going to work out here uh, will be for a constant flow boundary condition. So some flux is given. It may be because, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the reservoir on one boundary touches an aquifer, and the aquifer is flowing in water at a constant rate or something like that. Y you'll see that it, it recovers, you know, all you have to do is set the inflow, the influx to zero, and you recover the, the no flow condition. But uh, this will be a little bit more general, okay? So here we're, we're going to look at a situation um, where you have a Neumann condition, Uh, at x equal to L. So at x equal to L, that's the nth grid block, right? So where capital N is the total number of grid blocks. Right? Um, so here the boundary condition, we're going to be given some flux on the boundary, right? And do we have an equation that relates flux to pressures or pressure gradient? So Darcy's Law, so let's write it out. We have the permeability times the area over the viscosity times dp dx, right? And we're going to use dp dx is equal to pn, p capital N, so the, the pressure in the last grid block minus the pressure in the n plus 1. So again, this is some ghost grid block that's outside the boundary, actually, right, over delta x. Okay. So then we can, if we plug that in back into this equation, we can get an equation that's for Pn plus 1 that's equal to Pn minus Qb mu delta x over k. And for the area, I'm just going to say the height times the width of the reservoir, h times w. So we have now this equation for this ghost n plus 1 grid block that lays outside the boundary. And so then if we write down the equation, Now, I'm going to substitute in for eta because some terms will cancel. So if I write out what eta is, rate, this is alpha, remember? So alpha is, eta is alpha times <coughs> delta t over delta x squared. Right. So I'm just writing out the terms there for eta times QB mu delta X K HW. Okay, so then you'll see that the viscosities cancel, the K's cancel, one delta X cancels. And so then we have this guy.
So this would be the equation for the nth grid block if you had a constant flux boundary condition. And you can see that if the f if it, for the no flow, that would mean that QB equals zero, right? And so QB equals zero, this term goes away, and you're left, left with that, which is what was derived in the notes for no flow. You have a minus, you have a minus n, p n plus one on n right there. So then that cancels with that. Yep. The, the n plus one? Um, well, it, it, I, right here, okay, so let me get a different color. Sorry, I had to I cram things together. This term right here in the standard equation, right, is Pn plus 1. And, and so then I substitute in this thing, right? Right here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it should be P1. Well, uh, per time step, it, well, it, <laughs> that's a hard question to answer, right? Because per time step, there's no question the implicit takes longer because you're on the inverted matrix, okay? But the thing is, I can take unconditionally large time steps. So let's say I want to run a simulation for one day, okay? I can take one day time step in an implicit method and so if, I own, if I'm only interested in what the pressure is at the end of one day, I can do that in one time step. So yes, that one step is more work, but I can just take one, okay? Now if I switch back to explicit, it's unlikely that I'll be able to take one day time step and be stable, right? I'm going to have to take lots of small time steps. Now each of those time steps will be less work, faster computation, but I'm going to have to take so many that it could be, it, it could be more expensive. Yeah. Could you just take one massive time step and try to take implicitly the same results you get by trying to step too much? Yeah, yeah. And in, in fact, um, as long as the as long as the explicit method remains stable, there, and we'll show an example at the end. I mean, as long as you don't ex exceed the stability criterion, and you know it when you do that, the whole solution blows up. The air just grows unbounded. There's no question. The, the, the results look like garbage. So don't worry like, if, you know, you're worried that you might accidentally exceed it. You'll definitely know when you do. You'll, the, the numbers probably just all become NANs because it did, the errors just grow unbounded and it just gets large, okay? But so um, the point I was going to make is as long as you remain below the stable st time step criterion and you take a bunch of explicit steps and you stop at one day, or do you take one implicit step all the way to one day? The answers will be the, the same. I mean, to, to some small error, okay? Um, no. The more grid blocks you take, the, the closer the solution converges to the analytic solution. The, the, the time steps really only control, in the explicit simulation, control the stability, right? So as long as you remain below the stability criterion, that's really the only critical thing on, on that, right? Now, the other thing is would be 
just because you can take one implicit step for one day, you may not want to, right? You may want to see how the solution evolves with time. So you may want to take a bunch of intermediate steps. And if, and if that's the case, if you want to take a bunch of intermediate steps because you want to see how the solution evolves, in that case, you may be better off just running an explicit method because each of those steps is going to be faster. So it's, it's really, a, numerical analysis is always a trade-off between stability, speed, and accuracy. You can never have all three at once, and, and really you have to use your engineering intuition about and, and understanding of what you want out of the solution to decide which is the best. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in that case, you'd, if, you're, if your goal is to get to the end as fast as possible, yeah, you would want to take time steps that give you an eta as close to 0.5 as, as possible. Yeah. Well, because I, in this case, I'm always using the implicit equation, so everything is to the n plus one. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I haven't, I didn't use the explicit equations at all here. So, yeah, like you know, here I left it off because I haven't, you know, I sort of haven't decided yet. But, but as soon as I take it and I plug it in to that equation, it's automatically the n plus one because I'm, it's an implicit equation. Yeah, if, if I ask you to do it explicit, I mean, this relationship, this relationship would be the same, right? Notice there's no, there's no n plus ones or n's, right? We haven't made that distinction. It's not until you plug it back into this equation that those show up. And since this is the implicit equation, they're automatically n plus ones. If it was the explicit equation, then they would be n's, okay? So the, you know, this is your approximation for that, and once you plug it in, then then you decide if it's implicit or explicit. Okay. As long as our data is the same, yeah, the the error is is always on the order of delta t uh, in time and delta x squared in space, right? You derive, when you derive the finite difference equations, uh, and, and both of them are the same, explicit and in, in implicit. Okay. But by the way, there are higher, you, there are higher order methods in time. We could, we could do a better job approximating derivative. This is sort of the simplest way to do it. So, In the notes, um, after some derivations, you, you got to a, a system of equations written in matrix form like this, right? And so, uh, again, these assume Dirichlet on the left-hand boundary at x equals zero, Neumann on the right-hand boundary, okay? But I think in your in, in the homework problem number two, it's the opposite, right? Okay, it's the opposite. So. You could go on and derive all the equations again, and every time you do this, you have a, you know, a special case, whether it's Neumann or Dirichlet. But one, one thing I want to give you a hint. L let's look at this term right here. So this is for a Dirichlet boundary, right? So I have 1 plus 3 eta. Would everybody, would anybody be mad at me if I rewrote this as 1 plus 1 eta plus 2 eta? 
Is anyone mad at me for that? Can I do that? Okay. Okay. So everybody agrees that's the same. I didn't do anything. So what if right in front of this 2 eta, I stuck a gamma there? Okay, and gamma is just something I've just made up. It could be whatever you want to call it. And gamma has two. It's a boolean, right? It's it's either one or zero. Okay, it's one if you have a Dirichlet boundary condition. And it's zero if you have a Neumann. And then that's an input to your, when you construct your matrix equation. Right? So let everybody see what happens then. If I have a Neumann, the gamma is zero and that two in goes away and I'm left with one plus one, one plus eta, right? Which is the Neumann condition. If it's one, I get one plus three eta, which is the Dirichlet. Okay, so that, so I, I would do this in my, you know, I, I create a function that's going to create my A matrix, or you know, this this tridiagonal matrix, right? And I would just have as an input to that function this gamma boolean value, and it's an input, right? If I have Dirichlet on the left side, it's zero, and and on the right, right? And so, you know, maybe. You, you could also have that on on uh, on the other case, and maybe then you have a gamma one and a gamma two, or a gamma zero and a gamma l, or whatever you want to call it. Right? So I'm just sort of giving you a hint here. This is not you don't have to do it my way, right? but I think in the in the problem statement it said come up with a clever way so that you don't need a bunch of if, if statements. Right? Well, this is one way to do that, and of course you, you'd also need to take care of uh, this side over here. So you, that same gamma. Um, that same gamma would need to be over here, right? So that, you know, if it's zero, you have a Neumann condition, a no flow condition, and that would be zero. Um, Well, I guess, I mean, you, you could say, you could define on each boundary a PB, on each boundary, you know, so PB1 and PB in, and you could then say, you know, if it's non-zero, then then you plug it in, right, and you evaluate the right-hand side. Um, if it's zero, then it's a Neumann boundary. Then it's a Neumann boundary, and I'm going to modify this entry over here. Or in other words, if it's if PB1 is zero, then I'm going to set gamma to zero. So you could, could do something like that. So you know, I want to. Part of the fun to, of programming to me is the creativity it allows. So I don't want to. I don't want to tell you exactly how to do it. You can do it however you want, but th this is one suggestion. Yeah. Oh, it's in the problem statement. It's all on problem two, yeah. I'm just trying to give you a hint of, so that you can design your code so that it can accept either Dirichlet and Neumann conditions on any boundary, right? So that your this this tridiagonal matrix on the left-hand side here is not tied to a specific problem, right? That's what you really want your code to be general enough, you know, so that it's not tied to a specific problem. And then if I give you a new set of boundary conditions, it's just a matter of changing the inputs, 